know, so many problems exist today because people have problems with authority. I just want you to know we set Josh up to do that. He's not really that big of a rebel. <laughs> At least not that I've seen yet. But anyway. You know, everything works better when there's a capable leader that everyone else submits to. Whether it's your or my surgical team. And there's actually a lead person in that room that calls the shots when decisions like that need to be made. We need that in that room. I expect that you do too. Or perhaps it's the uh, teacher in the classroom. Somebody needs to be in charge of all those children. No better person than the teacher. And when the teacher's authority is respected and submitted to, that's a much calmer and more productive classroom. Head cashier at a busy supermarket needs to make some decisions sometimes that, that others submit to and the function of that store and what's going on up front is what it ought to be. A general contractor at a construction site makes the decisions, helps line up the work and the, the calendar of tasks that need to be done and make sure everything pulls together to get the building completed on time or early if possible. But there's that one person that needs to be the bottom line decision maker. A sergeant with a platoon of soldiers or police officers, a supervisor in a plant. I mean, the list goes on and on showing us the need for capable leadership and a lot of people that submit to someone else's authority for the overall good of the organization. Good leadership and the submissions of others make things work well every single day. And I make those points simply to say we live in a world of authority and submission. It happens around us every day. Sometimes we're in the submission part of the equation and sometimes we're in the authority part of that and we are making decisions or we are following decisions. It's a daily part of our lives. And Peter is writing to first century Christians and, and telling them that their true citizenship is in heaven. But because they are citizens of heaven, it affects their citizenship upon this earth as well. We need to be good citizens here. We need to be citizens that honor God the Father. And so Peter is going to challenge them about what it means as he continues to talk here about what it means to be a Christian in the world today. During this time, we are citizens of whatever country it is. For us, it's the United States. But it could, people around the world, it's, it's Nigeria, it's France, it's England, it's, it's India. And we're submissive to those in authority over us. But submission. Submission. When you hear the word, sometimes it changes the air in the room. And people start thinking about their issues with it. Today we begin with looking at our outline and the points that are there for you. And the first point we want to talk about is two difficult words. The words authority and submission. Authority and submission. Peter begins this section of scripture with a difficult command, not only for the people in the first century church, but also for us today. He says in the first part of verse 13, chapter 2, 1 Peter, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. Those first two words in that verse just kind of grab you. Submit yourselves. In the original language, the word submit was a military term that means to put under. And Peter is writing to a group of Christians who find this extremely difficult to do. The Christians in the first century, the ones that were Peter's first audience, would be those who were facing all kinds of injustice. There would be everything within their human nature that would want to battle against the authorities in their lives at that particular time because they were facing so much injustice. They were experiencing persecution for their faith from their government, from their neighbors, from their workplace, from the community as a whole. And whenever we are on the receiving end of injustice, how do we respond? You know, usually we get defensive. 
You know, when somebody wants to kind of all of a sudden step up and tell us what to do, a lot of times we get defensive or they, and that's just a natural response that we often have. We want to make things right. We want to explain what we've done so this will go away. If we can just explain, it will go away. And if that doesn't work, then we just, sometimes we just retaliate. We just whip back with the, the sharpest verbal arrow that we can pull out of our, our backpack there and just let them have it. And yet in the midst of all of this injustice, of this persecution, and a lot of things that were going on in the first century church, Peter says to them, submit yourself. Submit yourself. There's a few things I want you to understand about submission. Some of them you know already. First of all, submission is unnatural. It's unnatural. Dr. James Dobson in his book, The Strong-Willed Child, states that there are twice as many strong-willed children as there are compliant children. He also said that this rebellion against parents' rules often starts very early in life. In fact, it begins before they can even talk. Now, those of you that are sitting out there that are parents know exactly what Dobson is talking about. Before there's ever verbal, there's some rebellion. There's some fighting against you that will take place. But you know, rebellion... It's not just a characteristic of children and adolescents. Most people, regardless of their age, find it hard at times to submit to others. If the speed limit is 70, we drive 75 at least. If somebody says be to work at 830, maybe you choose to come in at 835 and just see what happens. Or 8.40. Because there's, I know some of you just wouldn't do that to save your life. You're everywhere you need to be 10, 15, 20 minutes early. But some people, when they just want to rebel just a little bit, they find their ways. And you probably have your own. Because a submissive spirit just doesn't come naturally to us. Now we might pick and choose people. We think, well, okay, I'll, I'll do what they want me to do because they pay my check. You know, they write my check. Um, or they're doing something to my vehicle or whatever, you know. And we just kind of find ourselves towing under them a little bit. But, but there's other people we find ourselves fighting against because there's just something we don't like. There's something that didn't register with us. And we, we find our own reasons not to be submissive. We rationalize. We justify within ourselves why we don't need to submit to this particular authority. So first of all, it's unnatural. Secondly, I want you to understand is that biblical submission is unforced. It is unforced. The verb submit here in this text is what's in, called the middle voice, which simply means that we are to place ourselves in submission. Christians, we are not to be forced into submission but we are to comply. We are simply to put ourselves in submission to the authorities over us. We're to do it ourselves. I love the story of the cute little stubborn girl that was helped in the car by her dad. And he told her to buckle up. <clears throat> and so he belted up, got everything ready in the car. He put it in reverse, turned around to start backing up. And there stood the little girl in the front seat. Not buckled up, standing in the seat. And he stopped the car, put it in park, and looked at her and said, Buckle your seatbelt. Sit down first, but buckle your seatbelt. And she just stood there. And he said, Do it now. Now, those of you who have been on the receiving end of that look from your father or your mother, whoever it happened to be, you knew some point when resistance was not a good idea. And so the little girl realizes it, plops herself down, buckles her seat belt. Father puts it in reverse, backs out of the drive, starts down the road. There's this moment of silence, you know, for a little while. And finally the little girl looks up at her dad and says, Daddy, 
I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm still standing on the inside. <laughs> now, Peter <clears throat> is saying that with rightful authorities, Christians need to sit down on the inside as well as the outside. It's one thing to just look like you're being submissive, but he's saying take the extra step and not just look, be it on the outside, you be it in your spirit. It's for submissiveness, submissiveness, what a word, for a Christian is done with the right attitude and not just the right actions. The second thing, the great motivation that trumps all. The great motivation that trumps all. Peter begins by a very, a very difficult command here, but he doesn't just stop there. He gives us some, some strong reasons of why Christians should submit, not just in actions, but in attitude. What is our motivation to do this anyway? I mean, this is an easy thing to do, so what is our motivation? He says in verse 13, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. I know what you're saying. Oh, he had to get spiritual. Because that's what we say today. And we kind of laugh about it. But what in our lives isn't spiritual? Really. If you're a Christian, <laughs> everything. But Peter's saying, we submit. Why? For the sake of the Lord. You see, when you have trouble submitting to a leader, you need to remember it's really God that you're submitting to. When you're having trouble being respectful to a boss, remember it's God that you're being respectful to. And Peter's saying we're to be in submission for the Lord's sake. Now, there's reasons for this. One is that the, uh, the, the, the submission... Uh, that we practice brings honor to our Heavenly Father because we are His children. We are His people. We live our lives for Him. And so when we are submissive, it brings honor to Him. Let's take, for example, that you're a parent and you come in today and you, you drop your children, your child, let's say, off down in the children's area. You come into the worship area here. You find your seat and you sit down and you begin to worship. And about 15 minutes in the service, somebody comes in, walks around, finds you, taps you on the shoulder and says, would you please come with me? I need help with your child. And so you begin to follow them out and you trape down the hall and you're kind of wondering, what did my child do? And when you get there, the volunteer who's been working in your child's class says, you know, we've been working for a while trying to get your son to to do this activity and all he's doing is, is the opposite of what we say and he's disrupting the other kids and we can't even teach the lesson. And we finally tried to take some things away from him and he grabbed some other things and threw it at a child. We told him to sit down and he's standing in the chair. Now he sat down when we went to get you, but he's, he's just disruptive. We don't know what to do with him. Now as a parent, how do you feel about that? You go up to him and say, give me a high five, buddy. No, you're angry. And you feel a little ashamed. Because this is your child. This is the one you teach authority. This is the one you teach to respect others. And this is the way they've chosen to act today. You're a little bit ashamed of, of their behavior. You're dishonored. Now think of the scenario being different if you go down after the, the, the worship service is over to pick up your child and the worker there is saying, you know, I don't know what you've done with this child, but they're the most helpful, respectful child I've ever seen. I mean, everything we've asked him to do, he says, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And he, and he goes and does, and he doesn't complain or mumble or sigh. He just does it. Such a great spirit in this child. You must be really, really proud. Now, now that's probably how you feel at that point. You know, either they're that way at home and you're just, you kind of are, hallelujah, great. Or, or maybe that's like something you're not used to seeing. But at that moment, you are excited because probably more than likely they've been that way. But you've been honored. You're pleased. 
And then you transfer that parental stuff to your relationship with God. And when you think about how you are submissive and you are agreeable, you work with people and things and you submit to the authorities, your parent, your heavenly father is pleased. He is honored through your submission. But Peter gives another motivation in verse 15. God's honored, but also for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Our submission can strengthen our testimony as Christians. These early Christians were facing all kinds of slander because of their faith. The people around them were, were accusing them of things like atheism because they were not worshiping Caesar. They were not bowing down to the other Roman gods and goddesses. So they were just atheists. They were accused of cannibalism because every Lord's Day they gathered to do what we did. And they... There was references of how, how Jesus talked about this being his, his blood and the bread representing his flesh. And, and it was just, they were, everything was mis, misunderstood and taken out of context. And these people are cannibals. They're drinking blood every week and they're, they're eating flesh. They're cannibals. They were also accused of incest. Why? Because they called each other brothers and sisters. Even though they weren't from the same mother. And so all of these things and, and many others kind of went together and these, the Christians in this day and time were, were persecuted because of their belief and the misunderstandings about them. And none of these things had merit, but these were slanderous accusations. And it's hard when you're being slandered not to be defensive and spew venom in return. But it's God's will that you and I live godly lives even when we are persecuted. Even when we are misunderstood. We are to live a life full of godly, of good deeds. Peter had written in just right before our text today in chapter 2 verse 12. He wrote there, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. We need to continue doing the right things, submitting to the authorities, even when they're lying about us, even when they're persecuting us. Because Peter says this is the most powerful testimony that you and I have. The lack of submission among Christians and the churches of this world has done so much damage to our testimony. Today there are so many denominations of churches among those who profess to follow Christ and so many divisions within the churches. I don't know if you found yourself in a conversation like occasionally I get into when somebody asks me, where did all the churches come from? You know, there's more out there than we'll ever want to count. And how do you explain to somebody who's, who's not a believer why there are all these churches? It's not a pretty thing to have to describe. Or they hear about this church that their brother goes to and they went to it once and all the people do there is fight and argue about silly stuff. How do you explain that to people that just want to know or ask? You know, after Jesus prayed in John 17 for his church to be one so that the world would believe, what happened? Where did the prayer go? How has it been answered? How have we responded? Have we worked in the same heart of the Lord Jesus? You see, divisive disagreements are not usually in the essentials of doctrine, but in the lack of submission to the rule of Scripture to leaders who have been set aside to lead. So often Christians are unwilling to submit to one another when it comes to their preferences and their opinions and their interpretations. And that's not a new problem. 
It was Paul who wrote in Ephesians 5.21, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You know, I think we learn pretty early in life if you grew up in a family that you don't always get what you want. I grew up in that kind of family. <laughs> you know, sometimes people didn't want to eat what I wanted to eat. Or watch what I wanted to watch. Or listen to what I wanted to listen to. Or play the game that I wanted to play. Or go on vacation where I wanted to go on vacation. I could, I could give my opinion, but I didn't always get what I wanted. It was a common almost daily thing sometimes. And you think, you know, when you have, you get older and you get married and you've got kids and you kind of got in mind what you think is a great afternoon and your kids got different ideas and you find yourself, you can be really bullheaded and make everybody mad because you want to do what you want to do. Or you can listen and do some things maybe you didn't really want to do because you love your kids. And it's just not worth the hassle and the heartache of disrupting everything just to get what you want. And you sometimes find you enjoy what you didn't think you would enjoy. Now you apply that to the church, which to me is just a big family. And we're not all going to get what we want. And our preferences are not always going to be honored. But we still... As Paul encourages, and if Peter is talking to us here, we are to submit to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. That's the basis of who we are as a people. And when we do, this is a powerful testimony to those outside the church and to those within. Peter moves on to two practical applications. Two practical applications in chapter 2. I think it's so amazing what he chose to talk about. The first application that Peter uses is the government. The government. Yeah, they bickered about it then too. <clears throat> First Peter 2 verses 13 and 14. He says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him, to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. You know, matter, no matter what we may think about our governmental leaders today, it would have been much more difficult for the first century Christians to be submissive to their government. You know, many of the first century Christians were facing extreme persecution. The emperor Nero would burn Rome and then blame the Christians so that he could continue to persecute them. Here's a fellow who's willing to burn most of his capital city just so he had another reason to criticize Christians and put them under persecution. According to the Roman historian Tacitus, he wrote about first century Christians these words. He said they were covered with the skins of beasts they were torn by dogs and perished. They were nailed to crosses. They were doomed to the flames and burned to assure nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Wow. And we think we got it bad. And it was during this time that both Peter and Paul were killed for their faith. And yet they both said to submit to the governing authorities. You know, what should our role be as Christians with our government? Well, the first century Christians lived under a dictator. And we live under a democracy. A rule by the people is the call of democracy. And so our responsibility as citizens of this country is to do our part to make sure the officials that are elected will bring honor to God and then we hold them accountable. Now obviously every person who votes is not a Christian. Every person that's a Christian doesn't vote. 
And so when we don't do the things in those areas, and we're not being the Christian citizen God would want us to be. And I know it's easy to say, well, I'm just voting for the lesser of two evils. Well, you may be, but your vote counts. It's, it's recorded one way or the other. But our role is to study and investigate those who are running and make the best decision we can about who would best honor God in those elected offices. And then we're told to pray for them. I don't know how regularly you do that, but that's what we're called to do. I think instead of complaining so much about them, we ought to pray more. But that's not always where we are. We also need to remember that whatever you and I do as a Christian in the political realm is going to create an impression of what Jesus is like. I think whatever we do in our, with response to our government, we always have to think about our witness for Jesus. Because people who look at us and see us respond and however we choose to do so, it's going to leave an impression of Jesus. Now that doesn't mean don't get involved, but it certainly means that we should think about our witness for Christ before we do anything. If we're going to stand somewhere and pick it, we should first of all think about what it says about Jesus. If we're going to be in a protest march, whatever we're going to do, if we're going to go out and help a candidate in a, in the, in a public way, how does this reflect on Jesus? And I think we always have to think about that. We can become an obstacle to someone we disagree with and they may never see Jesus because we have a very rotten attitude. You know, I hate your candidate. Our candidate's going to win. Or if your candidate wins, I'm done with this place. You know, it's just so easy to have such a negative attitude that we forget sometimes that we are, we're teaching people who Jesus is. That's our first loyalty. For his sake, we submit ourselves to others. And it's important that we do that. But a bigger problem for Christians is that we refuse to speak out. And because of that, there's a lot of things that happen that probably wouldn't happen today if we'd been more uh, vocal. Obviously, from Scripture, we're told to speak out in love and truth. And so when those two wedded together and we speak to other with good attitudes and we speak truth, you know, that's our task. And we need to speak out for biblical values like life and marriage and family because those things are greatly under attack today, but we are called to be salt and light lovingly and in truth, and we need to be that way. There's only one exception given in the Bible that uh, we are not to submit to the government, and we find that in the book of Acts um, in the, with Peter, and when he was, the, he and the disciples were told that they were no longer allowed to preach or teach in the name of Jesus, Peter responded in Acts 5.29, uh, we must obey God rather than men. And so when you and I come up against a choice of this is what the government says I need to do, and this is what the God says I need to do, we don't have any question about which we choose. We always obey God and we suffer the consequences, whatever those need to be, just like the early disciples did. But that's the only exception that we find in the scripture. The other application that Peter chooses was the workplace. <laughs> Two areas that people complain about the most. In 1 Peter 2.18, he said, Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Now, we'll just cut to the chase of this description and not get off into all this slavery versus the workplace kind of things. But uh, we need to understand that we're often in jobs where we have a hard time submitting to a boss. A survey was done and people were asked what they didn't like about their bosses. And the number one reason for this was why they didn't like their boss was because he or she told them what to do. You hear that and you realize we're kind of back to authority again, aren't we? So uh, it's just, they tell me what to do. <laughs> but um, it's back to authority and submission. And there's people sometimes that are harsh to us and unfair and inconsiderate. And we don't want to bend and, and be under those folks. But we're told in scripture we are to do this. Regardless of how they treat us, we are to submit to them as long as we work there. 
And people, uh, Peter knew as he wrote this how hard it is for people to be submissive to those in authority over us, especially those those are harsh. And so he moves to the ultimate example, our primary motivation for being this way in the midst of a very difficult workplace and environment. We find in verses 21 through 23 these words, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Peter's saying when you have a hard time being submissive to a boss, think about Jesus. Yeah, I know where your feelings are, but think about Jesus. Jesus didn't want to die a painful death on the cross, but what did he do? He submitted to the will of his Father. During his trial, which was illegal, he suffered unjustly even though he had done nothing wrong. He didn't retaliate. He didn't make threats. And Jesus could have done a lot more than make threats. This is the Son of God who in Matthew 26, 53 said, Do you think I cannot call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Jesus was saying there he could have called more than 72,000 angels to come to his aid. He could have done more than make threats. But he didn't. He submitted to the will of his father. As he was told to do. And then Peter says... Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. If he could submit, if he could place himself under authority, Peter says, then you and I could do the same. The word example that Peter uses here in the text means something written underneath. And the closest thing to, to, for you and I to picture this is to think of preschool children when they are first starting to learn to write. And they're given those bigger pencils and they, they looked at that page and there, there are letters and numbers and there are dashes like an outline for them to put their pencil on and follow. And that becomes the rudimentary foundation for so many young children to begin to learn to write. There is an example, and they put their pen and follow exactly the example. Now, Peter is saying, Jesus is your and my example. He's the dotted line for the numbers on the page or the letters And we are to follow and trace his example in our lives. Because we have to know. Because we choose to. Because we've submitted to his authority. Why? Because we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. And he died for our sins. Peter says that's what you are to trace your life over. It's the example of Jesus. And just maybe, when we follow his example, people will look at our lives and maybe they'll say something like, that looks just like Jesus. And we've done our job. Submission in the life of one man changed this world forever. And if we follow his example, we too can spread that change that he brought. Let's pray. Father, we know that times in Scripture that you teach us to be something that's so opposite what we feel, so opposite what we see modeled.
So opposite of what we see encouraged in our world, in our culture. It's just the opposite. And we have a choice to make. Who will we follow? And Peter knew when he wrote this, this was something he struggled with in his life. He saw it and struggled with in the lives of many others. But through his school of hard knocks, his own failures, his own life experiences, Peter realized the wisdom of truly following the example of Jesus. Submitting to his authority and the authority of those so often around us, our workplaces, our government, churches, families. We don't always feel like doing the right thing, but Father, that's what you call us to do. And it honors you and it's a testimony to who we are and it connects us with you. I pray for more courage to do that. I pray for more awareness of you that steers us away from our natural inclinations and rationalizations we use that we just can't help it. And if if you only saw, Father, what's going on in our job or our government or our family, you would understand. And that's not the argument at all. We're not good submitters. We have a sinful nature. We have rebellion in our hearts. And we do things that hurt us and hurt other people and hurt our witness for you. And I pray in our hearts right now, Father, we'd be sorry for those things. Sorry enough to make changes that will more greatly honor you in the days to come. Father, we face a very uncertain future, but that's, that's true of the first century church and that's true even today. But Father, we know that our greatest accomplishment is submitting to you, following you, doing what you've called us to be. Help us to trust you when maybe we don't see the wisdom of what you teach. Help us, Lord, to be people that honor you above all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes we're honest. We know that pride gets in our way of doing things that we know that are right. It becomes a hurdle that's so hard to work beyond whether it be receiving Christ and being obedient to Him or becoming a part of a church and making a commitment and not knowing exactly what that's going to mean. Or it's in our daily lives and we struggle with pride and we, we know that that's a battle we face and we know we have lost in that battle more than we want. We hurt our relationships with people and God and people we should be impacting in a greater way. And we just need to We just need to submit more. Jesus showed us it was a greater strength than than not submitting. May we follow his example. Whatever public decision you might make today about receiving Christ as your Savior, becoming a part of this church family, I just pray that you step over your pride if that's an issue for you. You make decision you know you need to. And for everybody sitting here today, I think there's some things that the Holy Spirit has brought to your attention today. You know you need to submit to the Lord and you need a different witness for Him. You need to honor Him through your decisions. And I pray in your heart you'd make that decision today. Just stand with me.